and welcome to the David Mack Radio Show. You can now adjust your headsets. This is Daniel Mack at the mic to begin with. We're representing Mack will be joining us soon. Had a busy schedule today, and we also have a active show for, for you today. We have a lot going on. We have special guests Daniel, and joining us inside the studio. So we will be talking to him shortly and getting everything going. So we thank you for joining us again this Saturday. And before we get started, we want to thank those who helped make the David Mack Radio Show possible, including the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've been guesting the show with them before several times. And the things with the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, if you're not familiar with them, you want to get familiar with them because they support businesses, especially those businesses of color, and also making sure that businesses within the state of South Carolina are taking care of our natural resource, making sure that the environment is taken care of. The environment, of course, being something critical that the Gullah Geechee community and culture actually took care of as well, too. So that's important for all that they do within South Carolina, the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. We also have Dr. Enia Connor from Premier Medical Center, 5390 Dorchester Road, internal specialist, uh, primary care specialist for all of our family as well, too. So can't give a better endorsement than that. Be sure to check them out and start your year off healthy in 2023. And last but not least, we have the friends of Jim Clyburn. Of course, I know everybody has some level of burnout from politics from the last year, but of course we know the political struggle never stops. There's a lot of things that always need to go on in the background from voter registration and voter education, and also making sure our rights are protected, uh, you know, the rezoning of South Carolina, which we discussed a little bit last week, they found out there were things unconstitutional in the way our state was rezoned. So it takes people fighting in the background in order to make sure things work properly for our political process. And that is why we are thankful that the Friends Jim Clyburn is a supporter of the David Mack Radio Show. So without further ado, we thank those who make the show possible. And today's show is a great one because once again, we are joined by Damon Fordham, who joins us on what is, of course, what is, of course, uh, Martin Luther King weekend. We know that the holiday is being celebrated this Monday. And we are going to take a focus in there, but more so about the aspects of him that usually do not make the limelight. And the thing is, I can remember just to kind of, you know, get this conversation started. But we do also want to pick up uh, Brother Fordham what you've been working with because you have this great new book that we want to introduce and and talk about and also with all your travels even since you've been here last time mm -hmm. so uh the thing is we all know with mlk and even from when i was a young kid coming up in the 80s there was way more coverage then but the coverage was very positive but it stayed on the i have a dream that that's where the focus was and it wasn't until i got older I realized there was so much more to him, but there's this immediate focus and spotlight on this one aspect. And then now we come to this present day, there's such a competition for media and uh, views like his, I guess they aren't provocative enough to get the same media attention that it once garnered. So just a little bit, once again, about what you've been up to and then bringing this up to your current thoughts of MLK and the holiday as it is now. Okay, well, first of all, I've uh, finished my fourth book, which uh, for those of you who are watching this on live stream, I'm going to hold it up here, the 1895 segregation fight in South Carolina, which we're going to discuss in detail a little bit later on in the program, because it is, even though it happened in 1895, it's relevant to now in ways that we will soon discuss. But I want to get, but uh, I've also been involved with, uh, let's see, I've uh, been basically join the National Black Speakers Network, so I'll be able to soon speak around the country. You mentioned earlier that uh, we that about my Africa trip. Well, we talked about that the last time I was up here, and I did, and uh, so I might talk a little bit about that in passing, some of the things that we didn't discuss the last time. But basically, I'm doing what I enjoy doing as a public educator. I've spoken with several newspapers over the last couple of weeks. Um, still doing a lot of traveling and speaking and so forth. And I have my YouTube channel, The American Storyteller as well, which this will be uploaded to, I might add, among many other things. So I'm basically making the contribution in the best way that I can. Because see, we all make a contribution through the best of our talents. Because mm -hmm. when Martin Luther King was marching, somebody had to cook the food for them to eat, right? <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. not everybody necessarily has to be the Malcolm X who's always making the stirring speeches. You do as an individual what is best with your talents in order to help make things better. And 
that's basically my contribution to this is public education. Now, getting back to the subject of Martin Luther King. What happened with Martin Luther King is this sanitized version that a lot of people see because because you brought up a very interesting point before we got on the air with this discussion and that about how people were told this and told that about Dr. King. And the plain truth of the matter is that the average person knows primarily what they are told. There are very few of us who go out and do hard research on these subjects to look on the surface of things. And those of us who do that have a responsibility to expose these things to the general public or mm -hmm. else the public wanders in confusion as they are doing to this very day. Now, Dr. King, <clears throat> you know, most people know about him through the nonviolence and the dream speech and so forth. But a lot of people don't know that during his last year, he was fighting for the elimination of poverty in the United States. He had what was called the Poor People's Campaign, which was this campaign to galvanize poor whites, Mexican-Americans, Native American Indians, and uh, other poor people in the United States to come together to march on Washington to demand an increase of funding for anti-poverty programs as opposed to what was being spent on the Vietnam War. In fact, as he was doing all of this, he was considered a traitor by many people because he was not supporting America's effort in Vietnam. He saw that as fruitless and that that money would be better spent with the poor. And in the 60s, that was a radical and revolutionary idea, you see. Mm -hmm. So he had to face that on one end. And then on the other end, you had uh, the more strident uh, aspects of the black power movement in those days, which he only supported up to a point in that people make it like he was the stone enemy of these people. He wasn't. His thing was that he understood that black people needed to have a better sense of self-esteem and a, a belief in their own abilities and themselves before they can move forward. He was with that part of the program. He understood, contrary to popular belief, that black businesses and things like that needed to be strengthened before people could move forward. He was not against that, as some people will have you believe. What he was against was the fact that if, say, you were traveling from here to Washington, D.C. or New York, there were many places where you didn't have black hotels. I mean, mm -hmm. I myself in 1968 slept in uh, the backseat of my car with my parents on the way to New York in those days. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. And see, it, and see, he understood that not every place had black businesses and black facilities and all of that. So naturally, they had to be, you know, they had to be fed. They had to have somewhere to sleep and somewhere and so on and so forth. You see, this is where the message gets a lot twisted. He was not against things like that. What he was against was understanding that you that when you are one tenth of a nation and you talk about picking up the gun and all of this sort of thing, when you are just one tenth of a nation. And on the other hand, you have the army, the Navy, the Marines and the Air Force and the National Guard on the other end, if you're going to talk about uh, trying to overthrow a government, with what? <laughs> See, he was against suicide, okay, which that would have been, because he pointed out that in countries where violent revolution was successful, you had a situation where the vast majority of the people had turned against the government, and to where the army had turned against the government. And when you have the combination of that, that's when you have coup d'etats, like what you had in Cuba with Fidel Castro and uh, in Nigeria in the late 60s and other such countries. Those were popular revolutions. Dr. King said in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here?, which I think, by the way, should be a primer for anybody who wants to get into social justice nowadays. He said that Anybody who thinks that something like that was going to happen in America, it, you know, just simply wasn't in their right mind. So you had to deal with the possible. You had to deal with the reality of what you had on hand before you could make what you want to happen into reality. Hmm. So the fires of change didn't want to be tempered by logic. And of course, I know what you're talking about, where they, you know, people, uh, contemporaries who were younger had this fire like a Stokely Carmichael for saying they 
always try to portray, yes, there were differences, but at the end of the day, they did have that, that same goal and were still fighting towards something. And, oh, yeah. And, and that actually goes into something else because they say, like, history tends to repeat itself. And we do see this now when there's so many divisions or fractions when you talk about that social justice and our approach to it. And we've talked about that several times, but what lessons do you think that social activists can learn from, you know, people always go to two of the most iconic, but there were several faces in the mix. And a lot of them locally here for our listeners. And I hope, you know, with between this holiday and Black History Month, we need to start celebrating some of our local heroes oh, yes. behind th these national things. So even though there are big name drops such as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but that, those are just the media darlings of that particular time. A lot of local heroes, but still... There was a lot of friction in between those communities and something else I didn't learn about till I got older. So any of our younger listeners definitely pay attention to this and know that, you know, I, I thought that the same way that I was seeing Martin Luther King celebrated in churches in the 80s. I didn't realize that there were churches who would not let Martin Luther King take a step into his church. That, that hit me later on in life as a big surprise. So all these people have the same goals, but they're different approaches. If you could kind of speak on that a little bit, please. I'd be happy to. Well, you know, Nelson Mandela said, and I believe it was his book, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, that when you are dealing with somebody's, obitu somebody's obituary often has little relation to reality. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. Now, what do I mean by that? Or should I say, what did he mean by that? That somebody's obituary has very little re relation to reality. Mm -hmm. It means that when people die, the narrative changes, okay? <laughs> and people can make what they want to make out of somebody who is dead and knowing that the future generations are not going to look back and know that history. It is absolutely true that in every stage of every moment, you're going to have disagreements. And because so many people don't understand this is a fact of history, they, they attribute to saying, oh, well, black people just can't get together. We're not united, blah, blah, blah. Listen, listen, listen. This, most people know what they see and what they're told. They understand hearsay and emotionalism. So if you get beyond that, you come to see that every movement in history, among every group of people, had disagreements, Okay. When they were trying, the reason why they had a convention to get the Constitution of the United States passed was because so many of them disagreed on the issues, but they came together. And so you wound up having a constitutional government in the United States of America. Right. So disagreement is normal and natural when you deal with social justice things. Now, getting back to the issue of leadership and all of that. Now, I see your father, Mr. David Mack uh, III, just walked in here. Glad to see you here. And he can bear witness to what I'm about to say next. Dr. King warned in this book, where do we go from here? And now this book, incidentally, was his basically his primer for what to do after we won the battle against segregation and the uh, voting rights and all that. Right. Which is why it makes it relevant to now. He warned against answers that don't answer, solutions that don't solve and explanations that don't explain. Now, what does your dad have to do with this? Hit very simple. The, he, he and I were in downtown Charleston during the George Floyd thing. And both he and I, and he's right there to tell you this, saw these people who were calling themselves activists running around the street. And we both asked each other, who are these people? They're not from here in Charleston. And they wound up being engaged in foolishness. Okay? And so... The thing about that was that after the tragedy where George Floyd was uh, had his knee on his neck and so on and so forth, you had to have leadership to get the hold of the people and corral those emotions into something constructive that would help put a stop to what would happen to a George Floyd. Because that type of leadership is not here at the present time. The people gave vent to their emotions, and they were often misled by agent provocators, people who will get around these young people and stir up their emotions and mislead them into doing foolish and destructive things in order to discredit their movement and make it a step backward. Dr. King warned against that. Malcolm warned against that. 
Even Minister Louis Farrakhan, no matter what you may think of him, even he spoke out against that kind of stuff. So, so we saw this kind of thing going firsthand, that with any kind of movement, you are going to need, you, you know, when you're young and naive, you figure, oh, the people know what to do. They have enough sense to, no, 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 no. It's not that. It's that the average person, leaders understand that the average person thinks in terms of emotionalism and hearsay. So a strong leadership, a vanguard, has to get up in front of the people and say, listen, we understand that you are upset. Let's get together and let's channel that anger. Let's channel that energy so we can make, so we can have some real constructive and cohesive change that makes things better for the suffering people of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, and, and that's so interesting, and I, I'm trying not to hog up with all my questions, but, uh, you know, when you talk about that in that last life, in that, that campaign of the poor, it's like, it's one thing when you're arguing about rights for, you're talking about equal rights and the battle for segregation, all those things in the 60s, but as soon as you start to pivot to something that actually would be a unification among all the people within mm -hmm. the states, and looks like it had the idea of getting traction because even after all these years, it's something that people are still fighting for. They're saying, why do they have us, you know, why are we being pitted against each other in a sense <laughs> when, when it seems like we all have the same struggle? It's like, you're trying to fight me over this and that. But like, both of us are very close to poor, very close to us are close to being hungry. Or both of us, both of us have kids that are at risk for the same dangers. So it seems like, with you know the timing of everything in which he tragically left us, even though there were many attempts on his life, many threats daily, and this is why we hold him so high because he still was part of many people. Who, he represents people who did what needed to be done, even if it put their lives on the line. But you know, even through all that, it seems like his life got in more danger the more unified he tried to become. Uh, same thing with Malcolm X. You can argue with many leaders. Mm -hmm. So just your thoughts on that as well, too. I'm glad you have, you brought up a very good point because, see, what people who try to fight racism and things like that understand, have to understand is why it exists in the first place, okay? Now, back in 1858, mm -hmm. even though the policy of this was created long before that, there was... a uh, James Henry Hammond, who was a senator from South Carolina who made a speech in the Senate about what he called the mudsill theory. And let me explain what that means. He explained that in any society, he felt that you needed to have the low class who he called the mudsill that did all the dirty work of society, the hauling of the trash, the tilling in the fields, and so on and so on and so forth. And you had to have this a uh, class of educated people who ran things. And he said, fortunately for us, the South has a race for that purpose. Mm. Now, so in other words, and so the, also the big fear among the white, uh, the white planter class of the South of the period was as follows. And what I'm about to tell you comes from William Watts Ball, who was the editor of the Charleston News and Courier until he died around 1948. He said that, and get this, that one of their biggest fears was that the poor whites in their squalor, in their illiteracy, in their suffering, would find common cause with the enslaved blacks and, for, and come together and form a social, political, and cultural will, revolution that would overthrow the power of the wealthy white families who ran the South in those days. So therefore, they had to pit those poor whites against the blacks so that these, so that they could stay in power. In simple terms, ladies and gentlemen, divide and conquer of the poor. And that's what racism is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I just want to reiterate how, how powerful uh, this information is today. And I, I really hope that everyone listening is, is taking a moment to really reflect and, and take in the information. Um, coming from a, a, a background or a family rather of, of educators, genera generations of educators, I have a question, um, not only in the context of, of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., but also just the, the information and education you're giving to us today. 
you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, CRT, critical race theory. What can we speak about? What can we not speak about? And I, I, you, you know where I'm going with this, but, I, yeah. you know, this is very important. But, but if you think about it, and I'm a person who, you know, I've been brought up in a family, loves history. We talk about politics. We talk about um, family history. We talk about cultural history. If you think about it, I've already been taught critical race theory. I've been taught about Italians. I've been taught about Germans. I've been taught about the the Spanish. I've been taught, you know, you're you're required to take Eastern European history. You're you're required to take world history. You you learn about, uh, so I've been taught about various races. You know, so the question is, and and I'm, I'm, you know, being rhetorical, you know where I'm going with this, but I Mm -hmm. I, want to be, you know, very explicit for everyone listening. I just find it funny that we say critical race theory, but we're taught about every single race except one. Let me say this to that. A couple of things here. First of all, what most people think is critical race theory is not critical race theory to begin with. All critical race theory is not black history per se, number one. Critical race theory is actually a concept out of Harvard University created by uh, Derek Bell and several other people whose name escaped me at the moment, where it's a sort of academic exercise in seeing how race relates to the law and how that affects the legal structure of the United States. It's taught primarily in upper level Ivy League law schools. It is not and never has been taught on the primary or elementary school level. What happens is this. You see, Among the right wing conservatives, they use what's called paper tigers. Well, excuse me, all groups do this. But I mean, in this particular case, this would be a uh, what's called a red herring or a paper tiger. In other words, when you lack a real issue to galvanize your followers around, you create these straw man arguments. These uh, paper bags that you punch on to make the people think that you're doing something when you're not really doing anything at all. And so they made up this idea that critical race theory is teaching extreme radicalism in the schools, that is teaching the kids how to be gay and how to hate America and to hate white people and all this sort of tomfoolery, all right, which uh, has nothing to do with critical race theory. So they put, they bundle it with all of that to make it look like uh, the teaching of black history is the teaching of hatred of white people and goes in with all this other way out left wing radical business to turn the people against it so that these politicians could get up in front of people and say, hey, I'm doing something about this. But that is not critical race theory at all. Now, let me get real deep with y'all in a moment. So allow me to indulge in this. Now, uh, as far as the teaching of real black history in the schools, here's what happened. You see, after the Reconstruction period, that period in which you had this interracial democracy in the South for a very brief period, you had from, uh, and I talk about this in in one of my earlier books, The uh, Voices of Black South Carolina, when Robert Smalls helped start the public school system in South Carolina, the same black man who led his family out of slavery and aboard a Confederate ship called the Planner into Freedom, uh, he was the one who suggested the South Carolina public school system on uh, January the 23rd, 1868 at the Constitutional Convention, right? We had two black lieutenant governors, Alonzo Jacob Ranzier from 1870 to 1872, Richard Howard Lees from 1872 to 1877. Richard Howard Lees, by the way, served under Governor Franklin Jacob Moses, making this the first time anywhere in the world that a place was run by a black lieutenant governor and a Jewish governor at the same time, okay? And you had these progressive reforms going on. But the problem was this, that was messing with the fact that it was ruining the the upper class who ran the South. You know, it was going against their system. So you had people like Benjamin Ryan Tillman and all of them getting the poor whites all aggravated to turn against this and start the segregation system, which we're going to talk about later on when I talk about my book. And so what you had then was the Daughters of the Confederacy under Mildred Rutherford down in Georgia and Mary Sims Oliphant here in South Carolina, they censored all of that stuff about the positive aspects of Reconstruction out of the history books. So you had pro-Confederate pseudo-history being taught in the public schools of South Carolina and other such states until 1984, the year after 
I graduated from Wando High School, okay? And so in 1984, Governor Richard Riley, they had the um, Educational Improvement Act, which states that, get this, and here's what a lot of people don't know, in the third or eighth grades in South Carolina, they uh, it's requiring the standard that you teach some African-American history. And a lot of people don't know that. And if people don't know that, they can't enforce the law. All right. So but so therefore you have these people banning this stuff in these states. And if these people were to study the law, they could put us they could sue and put a stop to that. Now, let's say you're in a state where they ban the teaching of black history and all this other kind of stuff. Not only can you sue, but here's what you can do on the other hand. The people who know these things can do can do this. They can go to forums like this, where the people are listening. They can go to these, uh, the churches, the Sunday schools, the meeting halls, even the pool halls and the juke joints and social media, wherever the people are, and teach them these things in a way that the people could understand it. And that way, the people could then teach it to their children. Okay, so just so in other words, just as how you have in uh, uh, Ukraine right now, where they're fighting against the Russians with a lack of firepower, they're using what? Guerrilla warfare, right? Unconventional warfare. Well, here in America, all we have to do is guerrilla teaching. <laughs> that's that's powerful. That is so powerful. Hey. And that, 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 that is so powerful. And it is really, you know, one of the things that uh that, that I was uh I, I'm just taken aback by what you said because I was just having a conversation. Um, not too long ago about uh, how we, we were having it in the context of how the family is changing, how the, 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 what we said is the village, the idea mm -hmm. of the strong, um, the, the nucleus, the, you know, big mama, grandma, you know, that, that idea. And, and you have generations or waves of, 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 of family members coming to visit. We, it's not that way anymore, just with society and times things have changed. But but the problem with that is as one thing that's been very central to our community is the passing of information from people. So what happens is that it's a cultural, uh, we seem to be fighting each other because we have this information online. We have this information to read here and there. But classically, the way that we as a people got of our, lot, our, our information is from someone telling it to us. That's, that's, that's built into that thread or, or tradition. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about guerrilla teaching and, and, and so forth and, and getting that message out. How, uh, my question is, how do we balance those two going forward? I mean, you, you, you see what's happening in social media and pop culture, people saying slavery was a choice. Oh. The 60s didn't happen. Civil rights. I mean, that, that's a real movement. Ignorant. That's a real movement, something. And, 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 what it ha and what it is, I know that I had people in my family that if that even came close to being a thought of mine, <laughs> it would have been corrected. It would have you been know corrected. So, you know yeah, can you can you just speak to how you know over time we've just lost that uh, that that ability to pass this information along within our family because experience is just as strong as a as a story. You know, when I was in Af West Africa over the summer, I had the honor of sitting with griots. And for those of you who are listening to and watching this who don't know, the griots are the his oral historians and storytellers of West Africa who pass down information through, through the spoken word, okay, through generations, okay? You have people over there that can tell you stories about kings and queens and tribes going back thousands of years. Now, you know, if you watch the, if you go by what you see on television, you will be misled into believing that the people in the back jungles are ignorant and all that. That's nonsense. Those are some of the wisest people I ever met. And so that's how they get their information. I saw young people going through manhood and womanhood initiation ceremonies where they had this close family structure among the tribes and all of that. And so that's what keeps their culture cohesive in West Africa. When we were brought here in slavery, all right? And as a matter of fact, I was at Gore Island at the slave port, which is another conversation another time. You had this whole thing. You were just talking about the big mamas and all of that. You also had the wise old men who would pass down who, uh, who which happened in which family and which neighborhood and which community over and over through the generations. Now, um, 
your father standing over there, Mr. David Mack. Do you remember Mr. W.W. W. Law down in Savannah, Georgia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You had people like Mr. W.W. W. Law down in Savannah, Georgia, who could run down that history like that. And you know, it was one of it was a great elder down there, okay? And you also had people over here like Esau, the great Mr. Esau Jenkins and all of them who could have done the same thing. But what happened was a lot of this was cut off through two things. Some of the people in the late 60s figured that because elders were wrong about something, they were wrong about everything. And so thus, a lot of that was cut off when that generation died out. And then the crack epidemic in the 80s also destroyed a lot of these things, you see, to a great degree. And so thus, that communication, was, that connection with the elders and who we are was cut off. Now, in times of crisis, false prophets do well. And within that vacuum, young people came to look upon these uh, YouTube characters passing off all this misinformation and telling them all this mumbo jumbo about we didn't come from Africa and uh, slavery didn't exist and all of these things. And because the young don't have that connection with the elders, they are prone to believing nonsense like that. And all that does is enrich the exploiter and leave the exploited with nothing. So this is why I one of the reasons I do what I do, because I was a beneficiary of wise elders and, and people with wise teaching. So I take what I gathered from them and I put this out to the general public. Why? Because I've been teaching a lot of young people, a lot of young people over the last 20 years. And a lot of those young people are now going out in their communities and teaching other young people and all that. That's how it works. I'm enjoying the show so much I I really could have sat in the corner and just, <laughs> just 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 listen and not come on. Uh, this is David Mack the Third, and this is really has so much. Uh, this is what I always call nepotism at its best. <laughs> uh, I've got two of my three sons here, Brandon, of course, and my other son. He is in Scotland, and we're looking forward to him coming back to to visit uh, soon. And yes, I'll have him on the radio. And I, and, and I thought recently about Damon actually being my younger brother, because we connect so well. We both learn so much from strong fathers. Yeah. Strong fathers, educators who, who, who understood um, um, history, uh, culture, and was able to present it so well. And it was ingrained in both of us at a very, very young age to have um, integrity in terms of who you are, who we are, we are as a people, and uh, not to hate. And it, all, all things as relates to values were instilled in, in us at a very, very young age. And it, it, it drives me up the wall when I hear um, adult people now saying, uh, I don't listen to the news. The news is negative. And that drives me up the wall right now because you, you, you have to know what's going on. I mean, that, you have to know, know your history, but you also have to know what's happening now. And history gives you the context of how you deal with what's happening now, especially if you're black. I want to remind folks of a few things that's, that's happening. The MLK services will take place Sunday. Uh, tomorrow, January 15th, at uh, Charity Missionary Baptist Church, the MLK Parade, which we all are familiar with, will take place on Monday at 1030 downtown Charleston. It'll also be live on WCBD News. And uh, Pastor Larry Bratton at Bible Way have a list of things going on this week. And, you know, he, he also... Uh, heads up the ministerial alliance here and uh, it's at his at his church by the way baptist church um on savage road and he continues to do a, a magnificent job but you know and and, and, and damon will be back on a, a very soon a, probably another 30 probably another month and a half because we've been talking about and y'all touched on it a lot today and it's very appropriate content and what and, and Damon does such a phenomenal job in presenting context content in this day and time, and it, it, it's so crazy. You know, we we all were praying with that um, um, football player player Hammond had that mm -hmm. very very tragic accident, and thank God he's out of the hospital. And it, I mean, I think people prayed that never prayed before. It was just really really something really moving, but just. 
had people actually saying, well, the reason that happened to him is because he took the COVID vaccine. Let me say this. You know, and, 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 and it gets back to what what we, we what you say all the time. What we, we've been saying, you know, the, the 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 you know, getting people to read is 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 what is a, a major hurdle. But then when you have this type of nonsense, was just an example of what you touched on going forward. It's crazy. Let me say this about that, okay? To go back to something you said a little bit earlier, a few minutes ago. You know, you we you know I've talked about the fact that you and I both came from homes where we had educated fathers, okay, mm -hmm. as well as educated mothers. Mm -hmm. And we, you and I both came from strong communities mm -hmm. that upheld the values that we were taught in the home. Mm -hmm. See, people like us who had that experience, we have to be there for this generation who did not grow mm -hmm. up for those things. Mm -hmm. And we have to teach this generation mm -hmm. who didn't have that strong father in the home, mm -hmm. who didn't have that strong community, who was surrounded by dope addiction, despair, mm -hmm. illiteracy, and all mm -hmm. that. We have to be out there and before the public and teach them what was taught to us so mm -hmm. that we can collectively make a better community. Give you a prime example. And I know people who experience this constantly in the sand. Mm -hmm. I was in the store a few days ago, and there was a, a young black male, and he really wasn't that young. He looked to be about, you know, maybe 21, 22, um, uh, busting a sag, as they say. And, I mean, half his, half his, his underwear is showing. He would have done better just take his pants off and walk in his underwear, you know. And, and my thought my was... Leech. And, 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 and you, know, my, you know, my thought was... A, a, a little bit deeper, you know, it's, it's bad, it's disgusting, it's all of that, but what brought him to this point to have the mindset that to disrespect himself and other people like that? What, 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 what brought, you know, what, what was lacking in terms of him being taught to have some basic respect for himself and for others that, that's, you know, for him, that's normal. Let me say this to that. Okay, uh, I was having dinner at, uh, at Hannibal's not too long ago with some people who are about your age who you probably know, but I'm not going to call their names. And they were going on and on about how the young people of today don't listen and so forth. Well, I know that one of the guys once was in, with the Black Panther movement and the other one was involved with a lot of uh, the things that were happening at the time. And I said, hold up. I said, gentlemen, when you were coming up and uh, and you were going through these things as you were young people and your adults tried to correct you. Did you listen then? And they had to be quiet. I said, why? Because you see, when people are young, they go through this phase where they think they know every daggone thing, even though they don't have a whole lot of life experience. So we have to, when we correct the young people, we have to be graceful and understand that when we try to correct them, they're not going to get it right away. But what we do is we plant that seed so that you don't put a, you don't put a seed in the ground and expect that tree to grow up with strong branches overnight. You plant that seed, you water it, you nurture it until it gets to adulthood. So we have to be patient with these people who didn't grow up with our values and our teachings and work on them a little bit at the time so that as the time they get older, they get it. Mm -hmm. And they come to appreciate that. And soon they'll tell you things that you taught them that you forgot that you taught them. Mm -hmm. And that happens to people like us all oh, the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So basically what we do is we tell them these things early on. And years later, mm -hmm. after it comes to a point where they get it yeah. and they, they got it and they appreciate it. But while we do that, it takes patience. To your point, I say this constantly. I am so glad they didn't have cell phone cameras and Facebook <laughs> back when I was a teenager. Back when you were college. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. There, there, there's some things I did I'm gonna take to the box with me. You know, I, I you know, but, 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 but your point is well taken. We have to get to the point that we uh, are constantly giving young people the love that we got, the patience that we got. You know, you know, sometimes us older folks think, that, oh, you know, I, I did this and I did that. And, you know, and you're not putting everything out there. And, you know, and I, and like, like they just listen to everything and stuff. But what happened, and you said exactly, 
exactly right. At some point, something is going to kick in. Something is going to kick in. <laughs> and the other part of it is just the love that you that you got. And, you know, for, for example, you know, one of the things when I was in, in high school to have your shirt out your pants like I have it now. You know, that, that you know, to have your shirt out your pants. So, so what we would do is we get get close to school, we tuck our shirt in our pants. You know that that you know that may sound bland to some folks now, but but uh, but but the concept is is, is that. And and I've, I've always you know when folks started talking about um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Day and what have you, I was um, I've been doing radio a long time. I, I said at the time, I hope we could be serious about that. I hope it's not an MLK sale and stuff like that. I remember and, that, and, and and you know we you know we'll just have um, it's it's a little cold to have to have barbecues and stuff, but we just have entertainment and stuff. And I think a lot of entities have done a phenomenal job. And you look at all the programs out here and the pastors that are doing you know certain things, and but we still have to impress upon people that this is uh, should be a recommitment point. And hopefully, prayerfully, you take the Martin Luther King Day and you begin to read some more. Uh, sometimes books, like your books, you begin to read. In other some words, more. don't play on the holiday. Work to find a better way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know. It, it, you know. It, I didn't make like, that up, by the way. How do you? You know. You know. How do you? You know. How do you program your mind? You know. Cause I, I've heard people say, and this has been a cliche. Um, oh, well, I'm not too thrilled about Black History Month. We should be doing Black History 12 months a year. And I tell folks, and my response would be, well, we didn't go to church. We go to church one day a week. That doesn't mean you act like a heathen the other six hey. days of the week. Oh, wait, wait, no. Why you brought that up? I have, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Why you brought that up, I got to say this. Now, back, getting back to Black History Month, see, again, the average person knows what they're told. And so many people believe this foolishness that they hear on the street and social media by people don't know any better that Black History Month was created because it was the shortest and coldest month. Yeah. That's nonsense. Oh my God. It was yeah. started yeah. by yeah. an African yeah. it was started by an African American mm -hmm. professor from your alumni how Alma mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, G. Woodson to recognize and implant upon people and the important Black History Week. It, yes, it was mm -hmm. Negro History Week until Negro 1976 yeah. mm -hmm. when it became Black History Month. So he did that because it was the birth month of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Okay, so you know, you got, again, you can't always go by what you are told. You have to do real research and read real books to get it. Now, now you mentioned about my books. I just want to briefly talk about the current one that I have out right now, which is the 1895 segregation fight in South Carolina. And I think this story is important because so many people think that black history is all about how uh, beat down we were and oppression and lynching and slavery and all of that. Those things did happen. But the, oh, this whole narrative that we just did nothing but sit in our churches and pray about these yeah. things until Malcolm X and Martin Luther King came along, oh, yeah. that is two words that the first word can be described as bull. Okay? <laughs> and the reality of it is this. All along you had resistance. Every community had its equivalent figure to Martin Luther King. Here in Charleston, we had the likes of Esau Jenkins and a man I was privileged to know, Mr. Herbert U. Fielding, right? In Columbia, you had Mother Majeska Simpkins. In my birthplace of Spartanburg, you had Reverend Booker T. Sayers Sr. You had people, and you had Reverend C.A. Ivory up in Rock Hill. And I can just go on and on with that. But now as to the book, though. You see, we didn't just sit and roll over like bumps on a log when a lot of these things happened, okay? Uh, in this book, it deals with how when Benjamin Ryan Tillman, whose statue is still at the State House, he initiated the Jim Crow laws of South Carolina in 1895. He had a convention at the South Carolina legislature to throw out the progressive laws of reconstruction and make segregation law, the law of the state. Why? Because he wanted to unite the wealthy white voters and the poor white voters into his power base. And he figured to do, to do in order to do that, would to be give them a scapegoat with the black community, okay, and disfranchising them, them their right to vote, which would create white unity and no threat 
to the wealthy whites who were in power, okay? However, black people didn't just sit there like bumps on a log. Six great black leaders, Robert Smalls, the man who from Beaufort who sailed his family aboard a Confederate ship called the Planner and sailed them out of slavery some years earlier, right? And who started the public school system in South Carolina during Reconstruction. William J. Whiffer, a black lawyer from Beaufort who had a law firm on uh, Broad Street during the 1870s. Thomas Miller, the founding president of South Carolina State University. James Wig and Isaiah Reed, two black lawyers from Beaufort, South Carolina. And Robert Anderson, a black teacher from Georgetown, South Carolina. These bold men went to the state house in the face of threats and insults to try to put a stop to that against tremendous odds. And they made these eloquent speeches. Uh, for example, uh, William J. Whipper, who is Seth Whipper's great granduncle, he got up and said that the Negro will rise, crush us as you may. You cannot stop the car of Negro progress because it is not the natural order of things. The newspapers around the world reported this, and even Booker T. Washington down in Tuskegee, he told Benjamin Ryan Tillman that if you think it is expensive to educate the Negro, imagine how expensive it will be to keep him in ignorance. And he added that it mentioned in the Galatians, what you sow, you shall reap, and that, that South Carolina would suffer because it was misusing its talents and keeping black people down. And that he said that would be no way for the state to make progress. And when you look at our illiteracy rate and our position in schools, he was prophesying and he was absolutely right. But in either case, though, these six men made this brave stand, and the way they conducted themselves doing that is so inspiring that even though they may not have won that battle, that they may have lost that battle, in the long run, they, re they won the war because what they did on there inspired the seeds that would lead to the civil rights movement in South Carolina to come. So it's my hope that young people or anybody would read this book and be so inspired what these men did with the war, with all the odds against them that would encourage them to take what they have in this day and this time and move forward. You know, going back to history and it repeating itself, but we also know that evolution occurs as history is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we're at a moment where we're seeing a lot of the progress, uh, especially in, in politics, as far as the laws. A lot of laws have been rescinded. They've been you know, taken away. We've seen the civil rights laws dismantled in different ways mm -hmm. but however there is you know it's just an, an odd time the same time they're being dismantled we're seeing different elections and, and campaigns and and people are speaking out so the same time that roe versus wade and things that happen as far as uh say women's rights but yet they've come out and made their voices heard within this last election so do you have just to get your personal opinion about this this is more opinion based as we get to the last phases of the show but do you think that as things kind of devolve, that sometime order will come back? Will it be, you know, in the sense of individual leaders as it was before? Or do you think that, I, I don't know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of different. Uh, it seems like right now, if you try to pick out just one leader, no matter what the level, locally, state, nationwide, there's a character assassination that can actually happen almost immediately. And we know that was one of the things that they tried to do to Martin Luther King. Well, they were in the process of doing it, but now it can happen so much more rapidly, even if it's just made up. So do you see that there would be uh, individual, always going to be brave individuals who need their kudos, but those who step up or will it be more of a, a, a nameless, faceless organization that helps to bring these changes about in the future? Because it's like this coming, but everybody always says, well, where's the leaders? Where's the leaders? Like, no, but these things are just happening. So how do you envision it? Bobby Seale of the Black Panther movement uh, told an audience on television around 1979, he reminded them that in the period prior to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the black youth on the college campus were the most apathetic that they had been in quite some time. Adam Clayton Powell, who was a great leader in New York back in the 60s, he spoke of how in, uh, he spoke in his book, Marching Blacks in 1945, that after Marcus Garvey was deported and died, mm -hmm. that lesser men came to the fore and exploited the people and that they had the people with all of emotionalism and no real program. Society mm -hmm. goes through these phases where you have this sort of inertia where the people go around lost in confusion 
And just at the right time, somebody comes up and does something that inspires people and goes from there. No one could have predicted that when Emmett Till was killed in 1955, that a strong leader like Martin Luther King would emerge just a few months later. Okay? Nobody could predict it back during World War I when we were being lynched all over the place and all of that, that a Marcus Garvey would have come just at that time to encourage the freedom movements in black countries all around the world. So the fact that even though he never went to Africa himself, when I was there, you had people who can quote Marcus Garvey chapter and verse, all right? So I say all of that to say that these that this kind of leadership happens sometimes when you least expect it. Somebody comes along and does things. But what can you do? I'll put it to you like this. A few, right after uh, President Trump was elected, I spoke at the uh, Philip Simmons uh, Elementary School some time ago. Mm -hmm. And a young, right after President o uh, Trump was elected, and one young lady came up to me and said, Professor Fordham, now that President Obama is no longer the president, what are we going to do? And I answered like this. When I was a little boy, I used to listen to Martin Luther King speak on the radio. I used to love to hear his sermons before I was old enough to understand what he was talking about. And I wanted to grow up to make great speeches like Martin Luther King when I got older. Okay? So... What you do, I said, is to take what inspired you about President Obama, whether it was his diplomacy, whether it was the way he spoke, whether it was the way he carried himself, you take that and let what those things inspired you about him live within you so that whenever he's out of the picture, those things could live in you to help make a better community and you could inspire other young people to want to be like you. That's how you do it. Absolutely. And speaking of, and once again, the name of the book is the 1895 Segregation Fight in South Carolina by Brother Damon L. Ford. That's the current one. I have also have several others. If you just look up my name online, you'll see all uh, four of them and kind of go from there. These are available in most of your local bookstores. Or if you want, you can just, just put in my name, you know, in the search engine. You'll see these books and you can order them, basically. Yeah, so basically, if you you uh, Google Damon Fordham, they actually have the thing where you can look up images, shopping, whatever it may be, and you'll be able to see the four books, which the most recent one, again, being the 1895 segregation fight in South Carolina, That's giving right. you history and also giving roses to those who did not receive them while they were here. Instead, they were getting threats, insults, as stated, but now we have a chance to give them the full appreciation for what they did and how we are able to reap the benefits in this day and age. Not only that, but I also want this book to inspire the young people that even you, if you may not have leadership like this now, learn from what these great men and women did so that what they did can live in you. And you can take that and take all of that to do what's needed for your community and teach other young people to do that. That way you can move forward. Absolutely. And before we go into our final comments, speaking of the youth, one of the things we just wanted to make our listeners aware, of course, we've had uh, several representatives coming in about the District 20 D20 PCP program, adult and community education program. Remember, it just doesn't support the kids. It supports the parents and the teachers as well to make sure that they have a full spectrum of support for our students. So once again, the D20 PCP provides training and certifications for jobs that are high in demand. They also offer GD classes through partnership with China Technical College. And right now they are having enrollment for entrepreneurship program and a GED program. So, uh, and we have this same information posted on the Dave Mac Radio Show Facebook page, but they are having an orientation January 19th from 6 to 7 p.m. at Burke High School Media Center. That's 244 President Street, downtown Charleston. And uh, a little bit more, the entrepreneurship program or the class that's actually going to start January 23rd. And a lot of people talk about the difficulties within the economy. A lot of people out there just maybe doubting yourself or wondering if they have the skills. Well, at the same time, you can go to classes to learn those skills and so on. So once again, entrepreneurship program, uh, the dates once again are located on the form and that is on our Facebook radio, uh, the face David Mac radio show, her uh, Facebook page. Say that three times fast. So we have the information there for you in order to read it and also information about the GED program as well. That registration will be held mid-January and classes will run through the end of March. 
So we're always grateful for them and everything that they do in District 20. We all know what District 20 and the schools mean for the city of Charleston area. And with the last few minutes here, uh, Brother Ford, I just want to give you a chance to uh, wrap up with your, your final thoughts, not only about, once again, this MLK holiday where you know, a lot of people will have time off. And remember, during this time off in the state of South Carolina, it's not just MLK Day. It's very reflective that that's also Confederate Day as well, too. So that's something to keep in mind. That's why you don't leave this as just a day off. The fact that that exists at the same time as MLK Day is a big sign to you that there's a whole lot of work to do. But once again, your final thoughts about the Simulke holiday and also about your book to, and the information that it can give to the people. First of all, I want to impress upon the young people that right now in this vacuum of leadership, you're going to see a lot of people on YouTube who have a following about things. And a lot of times people are not taught how to separate the truth from the trash in many cases. So I encourage you that when you find somebody who's eloquent and that you really want to listen to, do your research on that person and make sure that you're listening and following to somebody who should be followed. And make sure that you can look around other sources to make sure that what you're following is correct. Because you don't want, because as Malcolm X said, the wrong following, the wrong people can have you loving your enemies and hating your friends and have you going east when you think you're going west. So do make it a point that do that. Remember that eloquence is no and good speech is no substitute for true leadership. You got to look into who you're following and see that they're preaching truth. And if they're not, Marcus Garvey said that whenever false uh, kings and prophets come among you, expose them and drive them out. Well, basically, the main thing you need to do is to drive them out of your mind and go by something that's positive. And remember that it's always better to light a candle than curse the darkness. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. We, we've got um, half a minute left. I just wanted to say, um, Damon Fordham, about two minutes left. I wanted to say, um, Brother Damon Fordham, uh, you are family. We, you know, we, we really love and appreciate you so much with all that you do. And we're going to have you back real soon to um, talk more about not only your book, but also about that the, the aspect we, 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 we've always talked about in terms of social media because that's ruining so many people's mindset right now. Like, you know, you have all this, you know, it's great content, and then there's garbage. And then, you know, we have to understand the difference between the two. Also, I wanted to say that a lot of folks have been, um, and we appreciated so much asking about my, my dad, my boy's granddad, and uh, he is um, hanging in there. He's an in-home hospice, but he's, but he's alert. He knows who, who you are. He's He's hanging in there, so uh, we continue we continue to appreciate your prayers and support so much. Um, also, wanted to say that uh, my wife Cheryl is doing a phenomenal job of um, she has a research background and all of that, so she's doing a phenomenal job in helping to take care of him uh, and us. You know, how you old know, is your father now? He turned ninety four Christmas Eve. That's a blessing. Yeah, very 90, much. His dad is ninety four years old 90, and still living. That's 90, a blessing. Ninety four Christmas Eve. So it is a blessing. It is a blessing. Thank you, Damon, so much. We appreciate you. And um, until next time, to all of, all of you out there, stay blessed, and we'll see you next time.